Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast, Gavin Shaw, Alex Wolf. It is time to fire Tom Thibodeau. Or so maybe the Knicks think. Uh, we, we have a report from SNY's Ian Begley today saying that maybe things are getting a little heated for Tibbs. Also a report that they might want to trade a young player from a couple days ago, which we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet on the show, which is a little obscene. And then we're going to talk about previewing their West Coast trip coming up and what it could mean as far as implications for both those things going forward next on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Knicks in today's episode of Locked on Knicks is brought to you by BetterHelp. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. And we want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen each and every day. We're now available on YouTube. I can't recommend it as a substitute for therapy because I'd probably get sued. But hey, you know, if it helps you get through the day, that's awesome. But who's talking to you? I'm Gavin Shaw a play-by-play broadcaster. He is Alex Wolf, editor-in-chief of The Strickland, the greatest Knicks website in the whole wide world. And yeah, uh, happy to be with you, but also angry, um, but happy because there was a report that might lead to what we have been angling for for over a year, Alex, from the most reliable reporter in the game, SNY's Ian Begley. Yeah, uh, Ian had uh, some words to say uh, uh, about Tibbs, both in some videos and in a article that he put out today. Uh, so he always puts out little news uh, compilations with things that he's hearing in regards to the team or just speculations and things of that nature. And uh, he has Tibbs' seat as warm at the moment and had said, if there are more lopsided losses, quote, there will probably be consequences, which of course we saw a lopsided loss against the Thunder in what should have been a lopsided win. Uh, but another, <laughs> I just, I liked the framing of this from Begley. So I'll just read it. Cause I thought it was really funny in his article. He said, Tom Thibodeau was on the flight to Utah uh, for the next uh, road trip coming up. He said, he'll probably be on the sideline when New York returns home to host the Portland trailblazers next Friday. We say probably because the temperature on Thibodeau's seat was raised a little bit on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Gavin, I, I had uh, Matthew Miranda on yesterday to talk about that loss and also did a little solo ditty on Friday talking about jumping off points and when I would be ready to get off of Tibbs. That loss on Sunday was enough for me to say, you know what, that is, that's it for me. <laughs> like, as if last season wasn't enough. I mean, you and I were both pretty well on the record. I think, uh, in February, maybe we had our like time to the time to fire Tibbs is now pod, you know, where we were like after the Nets loss, which yeah. is also when James Dolan uh, told Leon Rose uh, he had permission if he thought it was time mm-hmm. to fire Tibbs. So glad to know that we're on great the minds, pages, great minds, pages, right? Dolan, I guess. Yeah, the <laughs> greatest, greatest musician bas- of our age, great podcasters, locking yeah. up, <laughs> greatest basketball minds of our generation, clearly. Uh, but yeah, so I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get Tibbs the heck off the team. But where are you at on this, Gavin? We haven't had your uh, uh, your your take on this yet on the show. Yeah, I think if people think things are bad now, I think they could still get a lot worse. I know that's that's not that's not optimistic, but I, I think in some ways this is one of the more destructive things to happen to the Knicks over the last 20 years. And and look, we could fill months worth of episodes just just power ranking those elements but what's so insidious about it is that it, it, it's caked into a coach that that overall in his time on the Knicks still has a winning record somehow and and nominally again has, has has done some very good things and and was responsible for a very memorable season but the combination of Tom Thibodeau and Julius Randle that that was hailed as as conquering heroes two seasons ago I I think if it can continues uh will be the death of the Knicks franchise in that this team on their most promising run and like as as I've said many a times and still believe um even even though it's teetering a little bit the the 
greatest organizational health they've had in 20 years. I think that is all about to fall apart if this doesn't change. And, and that is because the utter um, lack of responsibility um, for Julius Randle and or not responsibility, accountability for Julius Randle. Uh, Jalen Brunson was, was, was benched against the Oklahoma City Thunder despite being really good um, on offense. R.J. Barrett, despite uh, absolutely cooking over the previous seven games and coming off far and away's best game of the season, he was benched for, for Evan Fournier, no less, against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Julius Randle, who you can you can go to uh, Frank Barrett, uh, a former guest on this podcast and, and, and Strickland uh, contributor, his, his Twitter. He is about a 20-tweet a thread of Julius Randle playing terrible defense in that Thunder game. And I, I can't really sum it up any better than he did. So I'd recommend you to go there. But suffice it to say, it, it is the golden combination of inattention, laziness, pettiness, where he is still frequently arguing for calls on the other end while his teammates hustle back to make up for his mistakes um, and, and just complete lack of technique. And, and, and ultimately what it all boils down to is disinterest. Julius Randle is disinterested in playing defense. And you know what? Who could blame him when at this point we're going on three years of there being absolutely no repercussions for that happening? And, and to me, there, look, there, there's a million things we could talk about. Tips like the, the Fournier stuff is 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 just blows my mind. But I, I think the fact that what Randall is doing is, is tacitly allowed, not even tacitly, is allowed night in and night out, while no other player in the team is held to that standard because Randall is shooting a bit better this year from two point range, not from three point range. Um, I think that will destroy this team and guys like Obi Toppin and Emmanuel quickly who, when they're on the court, the Knicks are still far better than when they're off the court are at some point going to lose interest. And at some point are going to say, Hey, you know what? And we'll talk about this in a second because it was Begley, presumably from sources on the team is hearing that, the Knicks are hearing offers on Emmanuel quickly and the Knicks would put and teams think that the Knicks would consider trading them at some point. Those guys are going to want out at some point of Quentin Grimes, who's inexplicably like situational quote unquote, is he healthy or not healthy? Nobody knows. He's going to want out RJ Barrett. who you just gave that big contract to, even though he's not playing that well this year, he's going to say, Hey, why does Julius get better treatment than me? I'm, I'm higher paid than him. I'm younger. I'm, I'm more worth investing in. He's going to want out. And, and the Knicks who don't even have anything that great in terms of a roster right now are just going to fall apart completely if this continues. So I I think we are at a real tipping point. It's not a tipping point for something that's that great, but I think it could get so much worse. Yeah. I'm with you. Like I, I, I think that that's a, (laughs) your cat is, your cat really hates Tibbs. My cat agrees. He's with me. Yeah. If you're on YouTube, (laughs) you get the exclusive cat content. He he's very insistent. I, I, there's nothing I could do. I tried to stop him from coming up, but he's just, he loves me so much today. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that that's probably one of the underreported aspects of this is that there has to be some sort of, I mean, nobody would ever admit it out loud, especially because it seems like all the players on the Knicks are pretty well coached in media, you know, relations and keeping things in the locker room and things of that nature. Like RJ Barrett is a pros pro at that. Like the dude used to do fake news conferences with his parents when he was like 12 years old. Like that's the story that's been told multiple times. Like, you know, Obi Toppin is a pros pro like quickly. Same deal. Brunson is like definitely was brought up to be an NBA player as well. Like he understands how to play the game. None of them are really going to like put this out there. I don't think until perhaps after Tibbs is gone or something, you know, maybe then at that point, then they feel empowered to say, Hey, like especially if Randall starts playing that way for a new coach or if it's like Johnny Bryan or what have you, players are going to then maybe be like, okay, come on. Like, why is this guy not getting held to a standard when we are, you know? And and to your point, like Randall got to play those minutes down the stretch against the Thunder and like Fournier did too for no good reason other than just Tibbs was like, well, this particular grouping of five players is treading water right now. So that's good enough. I guess, you know, they're not, like gaining any ground in a game that was still somewhat winnable, uh, but they're not losing more ground. So sweet. That's great. A war of attrition is exactly what we need right now for the last like nine minutes of this game. Um, it just was further proof of how unimaginative Tibbs can be at his worst. And I don't know. I mean, I think that's kind of just been the story of the season. I said this with Miranda yesterday too. Like I think the Knicks record 
you know, Begley noted this in his piece that like the record's not that bad, but like things definitely feel worse. And the reason for that is that against some of these really bad teams too, that the Knicks have beat, you know, even though you could say like, if you look at their schedule, just on the surface, like, Oh, they beat the teams they were supposed to beat. So isn't that good? It is, but like the Pistons, for example, without their best player made it a four point game late in the game, strictly because the Knicks refused to defend the three point line. And unfortunately for the Pistons, they just didn't have anyone that could just finish that game off for them. But had they had Kate Cunningham and Isaiah Livers had hit those shots to, you know, get them within four. And then Cade was out there to potentially finish the game off. Like the Knicks might've lost that game too. And we might be talking about two embarrassing losses in a row to teams that on the surface are tanking yeah. or will be tanking. You know, you can only assume it's only going to be a matter of weeks until Shea starts getting phantom injuries again. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not a great situation right now, and I I can't imagine it's great for the locker room, but I guess we'll have to see how things play out and what the leak factory starts coming out with, uh, coming out in these next couple of weeks, or perhaps as as Begley noted, this road trip where, I mean, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, but I think that the Knicks could realistically go zero and five on this this West Coast swing that they have right now. And perhaps Tibbs does not board the final plane to come back to New York for that uh, if they do, because that would be, I think, a good enough tipping point given the the body of work last year and now to start this year that you could say, I think it's time to finally just pull the plug. Mm. Well, I think it's fair to say Tom Thibodeau is probably sweating at this point. Is, is there anything he could, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want the guy to suffer, Alex. Is, is, is there anything he could do about that? Well, it does get hot on the hot seat, as they say. And you might start sweating there. That's where Tibbs, you know, maybe as a parting gift uh, for me, I'll send him some sweat block because I've used some sweat block and it's a fantastic product. There's no, excuse me. There's no product uh, that we endorse on the show that I can more personally endorse than one that makes you stop sweating because I do nothing but sweat like all the time, even when it's getting chillier out right now, I still, if I do something a little strenuous, my body's like, nope, time to sweat again, buddy. Like get ready. I, I I told a story the other week about how we had that, that, uh, unseasonable hot spell. I was out to brunch with my wife and they hadn't turned the AC on. Cause why would you, it's November. And I had got a particularly hot, like breakfast skillet. And yeah, then the fire alarms went off like at your place and I felt really hot, and th- and uh, it just kind of made me start sweating in the middle of a restaurant, and it was not fun. So sweat block wipes can be your little secret to confidence. The sweat block wipes work for up to seven days per use. You can apply them on a Sunday, and you will stay dry all week. If you or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, make sure to try, try sweat block, and you can save 20% with promo code locked on at sweatblock.com, also available on Amazon. And we also wanted to tell you about one of our favorites, and that is Rocket Money. I I recently added a subscription to a newspaper. There were I got a special deal. It was one dollar for a month for six months. That was awesome. I, but I forgot about it at the end of six months, and then for three months I was charged twenty five dollars a month. I was like, I'm not even using this. I don't read this thing. What is happening here? Um, and and that is why I love using Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, because they will make sure that never ever happens to you. The app shows you all the subscriptions that you have in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. So cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash locked on. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on. All right, um, we, we can save some money, Alex, but I'm, I'm not sure if we can save the New York Knicks, at least under Tom Thibodeau. So let's let, let, let's let's just do a quick review of what's happened so far and, and how the Knicks have done. They lost to the Grizzlies. They beat the Pistons, who have the worst net rating in the league by 24 in their second game. They beat the Orlando Magic, who were without uh, two of their three main point guards, uh, Jalen Suggs, Markel Fultz. Fine, still a decent win. They won that game by 13 points. 
They play Charlotte uh, without LaMelo Ball, and if memory serves, I'm 95% sure this is a fact, without Terry Rozier. Uh, that game goes to overtime. It takes a miraculous performance from Jalen Bronson. They win 134 to 131. Huzzah. Three and one. Uh, they lose to the Bucks. They lose to the Cavs. They lose to the Hawks. They beat the Sixers, who are the only team all season long that is top 15 in the NBA net rating. They have beaten. That was a game that the Sixers didn't have Tyrese, or they did have Tyrese Maxey. They didn't have Joel Embiid. They did not have James Harden. They lose to the Boston Celtics. The Celtics set a team record for threes. They beat the Minnesota Timberwolves, who are the only team, maybe the only team in the NBA that's more down bad than the New York Knicks right now and was having a is having a genuine crisis. And, and weirdly enough, even though they employ Anthony Edwards, who's one of my favorite players in the sport right now, might be the only team in the NBA that I don't envy. And, and I would not want to trade positions with the Knicks. So they they win that game. Super. Five and five. Uh, they get killed by Brooklyn without Kyrie. They beat Detroit, to your point, uh, without Cade. And uh, it was still very close. And then they get blown out by the Thunder. Is there anything about this team that indicates with six of their next seven games coming up against teams that are top 15 in the NBA net rating, the Utah Jazz, who, who I went down to Philadelphia this weekend scout in person, they are very good. Uh, the Denver Nuggets, the Golden State Warriors, who are the lone team not in the top 15, but are the defending NBA champions, the Phoenix Suns, the Thunder, who just killed them, the Portland Trailblazers, who lead the Western Conference, and then the Memphis Grizzlies again. Uh, what is there anything that makes you think, Alex, they're going to win any of those games? <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's I, mean, show. <laughs> I mean, the, the, spoiler alert, the Knicks are bad right now. <laughs> like, you know, and these are we're talking about teams like the Jazz, as you said, are playing way better than anybody expected they were going to this year. Uh, so and they're leading the West right now, which is insane. Uh, so not putting any any stock in that one. Like, I definitely feel like they're going to lose that game. The Nuggets, I looked this stat up the other day uh, when I was when I was talking about the, the Knicks defense um, after the, I think it was <laughs> funny enough, after the win against the Pistons, I looked up the three-point shooting numbers because I was like, they gave up way too many open threes again in this game. Like, w- why can't they just stop doing that? Yeah, third worst in the NBA in that category. Third worst in that category and running up against the team that shoots the absolute best on wide open threes in the entire NBA. In the Denver Nuggets, they shoot around as of as of Saturday. I think when I recorded that show, uh, the Nuggets were shooting like forty three percent on wide open threes. I can't imagine that's changed too much uh, in the last couple of days. Then, of course, the Warriors, defending champs, trying to get themselves right. Maybe that serves as a nice little uh, uh, like tryout for Julius Randle or something. Um, <laughs> then the Suns, maybe another Julius Randle tryout game. Um, who the Suns are playing fantastic as they have the last few years. The Thunder, who obviously have the Knicks figured out, all it took was the Knicks not scoring as many points as they've ever scored in a first quarter. Um, and then the Blazers, I, I don't know, maybe that's the one that they could potentially sneak away. And then the Grizzlies, I, I just don't see that happening. They're going to have JJJ back by that point. The Knicks, we don't know if they're going to have Mitch back to counteract that at all. I don't like their chances here. I, yeah, I mean, they might, maybe they'll win the Blazers game or the Grizzlies game if they get that new coach bump. Uh, but that's it. You know, I, I could realistically see them going zero and seven over their next seven games. Yeah, I, and I would not be surprised at all. Yeah, so I think I think the concern on my end in terms of Tibbs's job is, what more do they have to see at this point, right? Because mm-hmm. he, he sort of is who he's always been, and I think. The only thing that's changed is that he is clearly desperate. And we saw that when he went to Obi and Julius and then it kind of worked. And then he went to it against the Celtics and, and the Knicks uh, got torched in that game. And then he, he hasn't gone back to it since he is trying things he wouldn't normally try, but now it's gotten to a, we're, like, initially that was kind of exciting. Right. And we were, we were enthused by that, especially after the Sixers game, we were like, all right, maybe, maybe he's turning a corner. But it, I think it's become abundantly clear, especially with Evan Fournier, that he's just throwing you know what at the wall and trying to see what sticks. And that, like the quote after the game when he was asked about Fournier, he was like, "Well, you know that lineup was was playing well. And we were just trying to find some life." I mean, to me, that sounds like a guy who is grasping at straws. And I think, given Leon Rose's loyalty to Tom Thibodeau, and I think Rose looking out for himself and saying, "All right, I could fire him." I could bring in Johnny Bryan. 
But if nothing changes, then like who does who does the blame go to? It, it, it circles it circles right on back to uh, Leon Rose. So I think it's going to take embarrassment for Tibbs to get fired, and I think I think there's a pretty good chance we get that over these games. Yeah, I mean they'll definitely get blown out in at least one of them, or maybe even two, maybe, maybe even three. <laughs> it might be like two or three in a row. I mean, I, I if I'm circling one game as the game that could potentially just blast Tibbs out of the water so much that they fire him, it would be that Nuggets game. I really think that that's the team. I mean, Jokic, Jokic with no Mitch to defend him, assuming that Mitch doesn't come back by that game. Mm. And like with how much he's always just absolutely annihilated the Knicks, even with Mitch, like I forget it. I just, I think that that game, they're just going to get slaughtered and it might be like 30 points or something. I mean, that because the Nuggets just, they shoot the three really well. Like they're literally the team that's built for the modern NBA, like, or one of them, you know, and they're, they're just going to absolutely eviscerate the Knicks because they're going to collapse like crazy on Jokic. And he's literally like maybe the best passer in the entire NBA. And he's going to find the shooters on the perimeter. The Knicks are going to be as usual with their hands in their pockets, not defending. So yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think it's going to take embarrassment. You know, that's what it would certainly take for Dolan to turn the heat up a little bit. Cause if there's one thing that Dolan hates, it's like picking up a copy of the daily news or the post or whatever, and reading mm-hmm. like about how much the Knicks suck or listening to like Michael K and hearing how much the Knicks suck, you know, uh, which I think it's pretty obvious at this point that he does a ton of that. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's it. Gavin, I think you might've nailed it. You know, I think he just needs to get thoroughly embarrassed, unfortunately. <laughs> and I think that that leaves us with, with a bigger picture question. Like, do we still trust this front office? Because I, I think through every, like, even even when, when we heard the I, the reports on Donovan Mitchell and like, all right, they want to trade RJ. Now they don't want to trade RJ. They, the goal, the only goal of this front office is to acquire a star, but they, they don't want to give up too much. But it seems like, wait, they offered RJ, OB, Mitch, and three first round picks. That's way too much. And they're like, no, 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 they didn't. Nobody said that for sure. Woj is, is not 100% sure what he's talking about. Just hold the phone. Through all that, like, we we've kind of kept the faith because they've, They've definitively done some things really well. Obviously, they've been extremely shrewd on the margins, and they've, they've been fantastic about acquiring second-round picks and leveraging that capital. They've drafted uh, exceptionally well, even if even if you go back and look at some of the picks and say, like, all right, there was like they could have taken Devin Vassell over Obi Toppin, or or they could have found a way to get Des Bain. Like, like no no team is perfect. They they by and large either either drafted correctly at their slots or outdrafted their slots. I mean, even, even last year where you can circle back and say like, all right, they probably should have taken this guy. They probably should have taken this guy. They, they got three first round picks and that maybe would have given them enough ammo for Mitchell. Like all that is well and good, but they have, they have tied their ship to a coach that we so clearly see is, is destructive to this team at this point. And the longer it goes on, the more the questions become like how, to what extent have they endorsed everything Tibbs has done? To what extent have they supported some of what he's done? Have they only gone along with it because the Knicks are winning? But now that the Knicks aren't winning and, he, and he's still here and they weren't winning last year and he's still here, what does that mean about this front office? And is there any kind of direction? And to me, all those questions were brought to the forefront uh, when there was a report from Ian Begley uh, last week about Emmanuel Quickly that essentially said some teams feel like the Knicks will be open to trading one of their younger, or some teams feel like the Knicks will be open to considering trading one of their younger guys as the deadline approaches and, and quickly it was cited as the specific guy. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe don't trade the guy that has these 16 points better uh, defensively when he's on the floor. Um, and the guy that I don't know is like one of the few, even when he's not shooting well, like just to watch play one of the few bright spots on this team with his, with his effort and his intelligence. And I, I would still like to see him get some more chances on the ball. And, and to me, like, I mean, I talked about this earlier this week when DJ was on, like, I think that's a big part of the issue with him is that, I, I mean, DJ made this point. And I totally agree with it, that he was, he was pushed from on the ball to off the ball. And that's certainly affected his rhythm. And last game we, we saw him finally starting to get it together from a shooting perspective. I, I guess all that is to say, like, what would like, obviously IQ is an untradeable. Obi Toppin is an untradeable. No one on this team is untradeable, but what are you trying to do if you trade one of those guys? Like, what, what, what's the grander goal as a franchise? Well, that's a great question to answer in our next segment. But first, I got to just remind everybody that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. And, you know, let's say you want to maybe foolishly bet on Emmanuel quickly hitting 
over two and a half threes and Obi Toppin getting over 20 minutes, <laughs> all these other things. That can't right, you got to, you got to give me 10 to one odds on that. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't play, maybe you could get all these, you could, you could place an entry on all these things using prize picks. That's because it is the best possible daily fantasy game out there. It's you not against a bunch of professionals that are placing a million entries that have insider, you know, reports on what players to pick to make them the most money. And then they, you know, again, they, they stack the, the contest so that you can't make any money with your one measly entry that you bought for like 20 bucks or whatever. That seems like a waste of money. Prize picks is way better because it's just you versus the computer. You pick two to five players. And if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to or you pick if they're going to score more or less than their prize picks projection. And you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. And prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. Here comes the big list. That is this includes the NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro, basketball, cricket, and more. And entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It really is that easy. And you can make multi-sport entries. So if you want to bet on how awesome the two New York football teams are and bet on something cool for them, but also how much the Knicks are disappointing you, you can do that all in one shot. You can you can have pride in your team and disappointment in your other team all in one entry with prize picks. It's great. And they offer safe and fast withdrawals and are currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% deposit match bonus up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, prize picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. All right, and we're back to continue talking about this. And Gavin, you poised a question right before, uh, right before that lovely prize picks read about faith in this front office, given how they've handled Tibbs, faith in them, given how they're apparently looking at young players based off that Ian Begley report. And yeah, it's um, it's interesting, and it's a little, I I guess the only way that I could really see something like trying to trade Emmanuel quickly being smart in a way is if they're able to get like an unprotected future first for him or something. But I feel like that would probably be from some team that has like real aspirations right now, because quickly looks like a perfect, like combo bench guard to bring yeah. off of a team like, you name it, you know, what's your favorite contender? Like every single one of them would probably say, sure, we'd love to have Emmanuel quickly off the bench. Like this guy can handle the ball. He can shoot. He can play on or off ball. Like he defends his butt off. Like for whatever reason, he's only getting like, you know, 15 minutes some nights, but like we would gladly give him like 25 because he seems like an overwhelming positive right now. Um, so, you know, maybe some team gives up like a 2025 first rounder or something for him, but is that really a win for the Knicks? Like, oh, you parlayed the 25th pick into the 25th pick five years later. <laughs> like, is that that's not a huge win to me? Uh, and it would it would just kind of show a weird commitment by them to giving Tibbs as much time as they did, despite the fact that he wasn't playing these guys, and then ultimately like kind of selling low. And like we've seen enough from quickly from topping from grimes from even like deuce mcbride to say like i think these guys have all shown enough that with consistent minutes they would well outplay their draft spots and probably be a real consideration when their second contract comes up much like rj barrett was this past year and you know it's it's sort of on tibbs that that's not the case now because they haven't been playing consistently and you know, you could point to per 36 numbers all you want, but if you took Obi Toppin and tried to say to, like, some team, like, here's this guy, you know, give us a first-round pick for him or, like, you know, a, a another young player in a first-round pick or something, those teams would be like, well, why would we do that? He's not even playing for you guys. Like, he's barely touching the floor. 
So, you know, this is all theoretical. It's all per 36 numbers and stuff. You can't, you can't make a, a decision based off of that. We have to see more empirical evidence that he's actually this good. And that's sort of this like part of the, where, what the Knicks have decided to do throughout Tibbs' tenure and particular, particularly this year where they've kind of decided like, we're going to try to have our cake and eat it too. It just doesn't work. You know, it was fun in 20 to 21 because the, you know, the veterans contributed. Some of the young players contributed like quickly was a rookie. Then that's different. You know, quickly was getting roughly the same amount of minutes though, back then as he does now. And Obi Tapa was getting roughly the same minutes back then as he does now. And wasn't nearly as good, you know? So it's, it's kind of like with each year, it gets more egregious to have those guys not play when they've clearly shown things in the NBA and, you know, then you even have, like you mentioned earlier, the, this instance of Tibbs not playing their most prized young player in R.J. Barrett down the stretch of a game in favor of Evan Fournier when R.J. only played two minutes in the second half the other day. And, like, yes, some of the other units found something. And, yes, he struggled in the first half. But that feels awfully punitive for a guy that is traditionally a second half of a game player anyway. and has had shown what he had over the last like seven games prior to that. So yeah, it's, it's all just a messy situation. I don't love it. And if this eventually leads to like Tibbs gets fired in like a week and then Emmanuel quickly gets traded for, I won't call pennies on the dollar, but let's just say like effectively what amounts to like kicking the can down the road by saying, okay, we, we drafted this guy with the 25th pick in 2020. We're now trading him for a pick that'll probably end up 20 to 30 a couple of years from now. I think that's, that's where you're starting to hone in on. Maybe this is one of the first major failures of this front office because they've done a, in my opinion, a great job of identifying talent, but thus far have done a pretty poor job of featuring that talent, which comes back to their decision to keep Tibbs on probably past his welcome at this point yeah i just i i think i mean i i said this last year but to me the lack of donovan mitchell trade should have been a ringing indictment on the knicks process with their young players and that their value wasn't necessarily like congruent with, with around the league with how the knicks and, and and people who watch this team every day view those young guys and it was warranted because like, as, as i've said a million times in this show other teams could just come back to the Knicks and say, "Hey, you didn't even, you guys sucked last year or you were mediocre at best and you didn't want to play these guys. Why should we be giving you a Donovan Mitchell or or Shea Gilgis Alexander or whoever else for them?" And and those teams were right. And and even if it was just a negotiation tactic, you you said it too. Like you got to play up all their values and you got to see like if there's something special there. Like I would Love to get, I mean, obviously with Jalen Brunson, you're not going to get crazy amounts of minutes with this lineup, but just, just give me a manual quickly, a healthy Quentin Grimes, RJ Baird and Cam Reddish on the court together. Um, there, there was a stat out there. I think I think there was, it was tweeted from the Strickland account. I, IQ, Cam and RJ have played four minutes together this year. Like you're not giving your two best defenders in IQ and Reddish outside of Mitch and, 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 and Grimes, if he's healthy, an opportunity to improve a unit that has been disastrously bad mostly playing bad offenses and, and, and is about to run into some really good offenses and, and is about to go from, again, post all-star break last year, the best defense in the league to uh, one of the five or so worst, like give those guys some run. And at the very least, if your only goal is to create some positive momentum, we've seen what those guys can do and how those guys can play. I mean, you, you could, you could throw Obi into that mix. Like of course, Brunson will be in that mix. Heck, again, Julius, if he's playing 15 to 20 minutes a game, like he's a he's a perfectly tolerable bench player. I, I don't think that's an exaggeration to say. Um, there is a fun team in here. I still believe that. And whether that team like gets to like the nine seed, like personally, I think that's that's terrible, like given like what their organizational goals should be. But I can totally live with it as long as the process is good. And the process is highlighting all these young guys, seeing who to keep, maximizing their value before you trade some of them, and at least knowing what you're trading away so it doesn't come back to butt you down the road. Um, and if this front office doesn't do that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to lose faith because to me, that just seems so obviously like the only non-insane direction. And, and I know people are always like, oh, you're paying Julius dot, dot, dot money. You can't, you can't bench him. You can't play him off the bench. Like, I mean, you, you're, you're taking a, it's like a sunk cost fallacy, right? Like 
he, he's already bad at defense. Playing him more minutes isn't going to make him any better at defense. In fact, it's going to make him worse at defense. So if, if, if he's a sunk cost, so be it. Let, let him let him be a super sub because him starting and playing big minutes, I, I'll, I'll conclude on this because it was my first point. I think it will erode anything good going on with this team. Or you need to get him a coach that's going to make there be consequences. For I think, he, I mean, that's that those are consequences to me playing him 20 minutes a game. And if he plays more defense, he can play more. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. You know, but Tibbs obviously is never going to do that at this no. point. So that's the mm-hmm. biggest problem with him. You know, maybe you bring in Johnny Bryant and Johnny Bryant kind of puts his foot down and says, all right, dude, well, I've got a directive here to play Obi Toppin as much as humanly possible. So, you know, either get it together or don't. But like, if you don't, he's just going to play like 38 minutes a game uh, and you could play whatever's left, you know. So uh, that's probably what it would take to get positive results out of Julius Randle at this point. We'll see if that ends up happening. Uh, I'm, I, I kind of agree with everything you said in that last bit there, so I don't have too much to add. And I feel like I've talked myself blue in the face on the tip stuff the, over this whole like long weekend. So I don't know if I have too much more to add other than what I've said in the, the previous two shows before this uh, or two of the last three before this. But actually, honestly, all three. There's There was undertones in the Pistons one too, even though they won. Uh, so I'll end this conversation here. So... Thank you all for listening to Locked on Knicks. Of course, we will have more coming up throughout this road trip and everything else uh, to see uh, what the case ends up being with Tom Thibodeau and the New York Knicks and whatever else may come up. I think Gavin has a a good episode planned with a couple of our draft buddies to preview the college season. So if uh, the Knicks <laughs> do start their way onto an 05 row 7 stretch here, Maybe it's time to dust off the old uh, tankathon and start thinking about that kind of stuff. But until next time, thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you all soon. Peace out.